Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Trey Grayson. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics. I want to welcome everybody to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum here at the Harvard Kennedy School. We're really excited to have um, Governor Ed Rendell with us, not just tonight here in the forum, but this whole week as a visiting fellow. And he's going to um, have plenty of opportunities to talk about a whole host of issues. And tonight we're going to begin with a simple conversation uh, kind of, we'll range on a range of topics, and as always is our custom, uh, after the governor and I have talked for a few minutes, we'll open it up, uh, the microphones to, to questions and from the audience. I want to begin with, with a little bit of an introduction. Many of you probably know this, but I want to fill in the color uh, to the governor's biography. He served as the governor of Pennsylvania from 2003 to 2011. He was also the mayor of Philadelphia from 1992 to 1999. As governor, he oversaw a $28.3 billion budget, and Pennsylvania was the nation's, is the nation's sixth most populous state. Uh, he has a proven track record of getting big things done and doing so in a bipartisan manner. Uh, he's tackled tough issues from education reform to taxes to creating jobs, and his leadership skills were taken to a national level when he chaired both the Democratic National Committee as well as the National Governors Association. When he was the mayor of Philadelphia, he led what the New York Times called the most stunning turnaround in recent urban history. And it was the subject of the book Prayer for the City by Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Buzz Bissinger. Rendell was called one of America's best, most interesting mayors. <laughs> before, ser before serving as mayor, Rendell was elected district attorney of the city of Philadelphia for two terms from 1978 through 1985, currently teaches government and politics courses at, at Penn, hosts a sports talk show in Philadelphia. He did say that we agreed, no Red Sox questions, no Phillies questions. <laughs> so I guess that means Pats and Eagles questions are fair game. And often <laughs> appears as a political commentator on the NBC networks. An Army veteran, he holds a BA from the University of Pennsylvania and a JD from the Villanova School of Law. Please join me in welcoming Governor Ed Rendell to Harvard. Okay. Mm -hmm. Why don't we just uh, you know, start at the beginning? How did you get your start in politics? Did you want to run uh, at, a, at a young age? Was it something that came to you when you worked in the district attorney's office? I'm losing, the, I'm losing this thing, but I'll put it in my pocket. Um, no, actually, um, it's a little bit like JFK's famous comment about how he became a war hero. He said, it was easy. They sunk my boat. Well. <laughs> I was working right out of law school. I got a, actually in law school, I got a job working for the district attorney of Philadelphia, whose name was Arlen Specter. And uh, Arlen Specter is many things and a very complex guy and a lot of bad things you can say about him, but an awful lot of good things. And he was a terrific DA. He revolutionized the DA's office in Philadelphia. It had been a patronage pit and everything was fixable till Arlen Specter got elected. And he, totally turned it around. You didn't have to tell him what party you were registered. You didn't need anybody's recommendation. He hired by talent alone. And uh, uh, I went to work for him right out of law school. I had been a summer intern, got paid $1.25 an hour nice. my first year, um, and made $80 a week. So you can imagine how many hours I worked. Yeah. Um, and then I got a job as an assistant DA. And I rose to be chief for the homicide unit in the DA's office in six years. And Arlen Specter ran for a third term, probably a big mistake, because everyone knew he wanted to run for governor two years later. And students all day have been asking me for advice about politics, and uh, I'm looking at Tad Devine, and we know this to be true. Don't run for an office that everyone knows you don't want to hold for very long. Mm -hmm. It's a prescription for disaster. And Arlen Specter lost, and he lost to a Democrat. And uh, the Democrat uh, uh, was a def criminal defense lawyer who never thought he could win, who ran just to build up his practice, and he turned the office back into a plea bargain mill. Uh, everything was, was corruptible. Everything could be fixed. Everyone could be reached. And those of us who worked for Arlen, we believed Arlen had this great capacity to make us feel like we were the guardians at the gates of hell, and if it wasn't for us, the city would slip down into, into, into horrible places. And so we believed that the office had been violated. 
And as Fitzpatrick came up for re-election, I couldn't believe that no major Democrat was going to challenge him in the primaries. So I said, heck, this guy has ruined the office that I love. I was out of the office. I left. He's ruined the office that I love. I'm going to run against him. I'm not going to win, but I'm going to make a statement. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wound up just working my tail off. I raised $58,000, of which 20000 of it was loans I took out. Fitzpatrick and the Democratic machine spent about a half a million, and I got 69% of the vote. Nice. Almost nothing to do with me. It was all <laughs> anti-Fitzpatrick. I got a big help from the media and the newspapers, and uh, they buried him for the things that he had done. And so I almost was an accidental elected official. That's a lot of people get their start that way. Absolutely. So you, you've held three different offices, uh, three different elected offices. Um, I, I'll go ahead and ask this. Which one did you like the best between the DA, the mayor, and the governor? Actually, I like being an assistant DA the best because you didn't have to worry about budget or anything like that. <laughs> but of the three, just in pure liking, probably mayor. Um, mayor's a great job. Uh, I'm sure if Mayor Menino was here, he'd tell you the same reason. <clears throat> because it's a very visceral, hands-on job. And if that's your personality, it's a perfect fit, and it is mine. You're the first responder. Anything that goes wrong, it's the mayor. What's the mayor going to do about this? What's the mayor going to do about that? You know, mayor, why don't you get us a political convention? Mayor, we need more hotels. Mayor, But if you like that stuff, if you like being at the center of, the, of action, it's a terrific job. And after a while, if you do it well, citizens believe you can accomplish anything. Like I said this morning, I said, if a giant meteor was falling down on Earth and it was destined to hit Philadelphia, the people of Philadelphia would have said, it's all right, the mayor will figure out some way to <laughs> deflect the meteor. And so that was number one reason I liked it. And number two is, it's a, being mayor, you're in a single media market. And if you do your job well, you're on TV all the time. And you can use your force of personality or the force of your ideas to get things done, to build a constituency for change. It's much harder as governor when you've got in a state like Pennsylvania, you have six different media markets. It's much harder to, to get things done by force of personality or the force of your ideas. The only trade-off is governor has infinitely more resources. Talk about public education, mayors can do process things and rearrange structures, but they can't generate much more money for education. As governor, you can, and I said this morning, we, by the time I left as governor, Pennsylvania was spending four and a half billion dollars more on public education than, uh, annually than before I got to uh, become governor. And a great deal of that was coming to the poorest school districts, and the progress we made was phenomenal. Uh, the Education Research Council said in 2010, Pennsylvania was number one in the nation in progress over the last decade on the national test. You can't trust the state tests because mm -hmm. they're apples right. and oranges, but the national test every state takes. So more resources, less action, less hands-on. As mayor, just, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great job. If I, wouldn't, if I hadn't been term limited, I might be <laughs> mayor today. You mentioned education reform as uh, something you were very proud of when you were governor. Is that maybe your proudest achievement? Now, people always ask me that, and it's a tough question, because you, if, if you believe in what you did and what you wanted to do, there's a lot of things. But, but I think because education is the key to so much, education is the key to economic development. I mean, if we want, as a country, to have a viable economy 15, 20 years down the road, we better, sure as heck, start putting resources into education, start finding ways to improve our educational system it's the key. So I think because it's at the fulcrum of so many different things, probably my best, the best achievement. I mean, when I became governor, we were in the bottom third of states in the national test. When I left, we were fourth. And Pennsylvania eighth graders were first in the nation in reading. First in the nation in reading. You have to understand, we have a lot of tough urban centers. And Reading, PA, one of the poorest towns, cities in America, a city where 40% of the kids are ESL kids. Um, cities like that, Allentown, uh, Harrisburg, 
Philadelphia itself, Pittsburgh, a lot of urban centers that are tough to move educationally, and, and we did a good job doing it. And I'm not saying we did it just by spending more money, because you have to target the money to things that work. But everyone knows that quality pre-K makes a huge difference in K through 12 development. When I say quality pre-K, educational pre-K with people who are trained. Full day kindergarten, the science of education says nothing is more important in student achievement than full day K through 12 than having that full day kindergarten. Uh, reducing class sizes K through three, after school tutoring. We had, we had, when I became governor of Pennsylvania, didn't give a dime to any of those things. We now tutor about 85,000 children after school, one teacher to five or six kids, and our success rate, for these are kids who are below proficiency in either reading or math or both, our success rate within one semester, 77% of the kids um, become proficient in the subject they were not proficient in. It's extraordinary, and, and those things, if you look at all of them, how can you do full day kindergarten? You need money. How do you do quality pre-K and have pre-K teaching adequately? You need money. How do you reduce class sizes from, from 30 or 40 kids to 17 or 18? Costs money. How do you do after school tutoring? Costs money. So don't tell me that money doesn't make a difference in education spending. It's not a guarantee spending money that you'll have a good education system, but if you don't spend enough, it's a guarantee you won't. Where'd you find the money? Did you find efficiencies in other areas? Well, actually, raise, raise some revenue, as, they, <laughs> as we now say? We actually did two things. Um, over the course of eight years, we took about $2 billion out of the cost of operating the government. There's a line in every government uh, budget called GGO, General Government Operations. Right. When I left Harrisburg, the line for GGO was less than it was in 2002. I don't mean less adjusted for inflation. Less than actual dollars. Less. Yeah. Because in any government, even well-run governments, there's tons of ways to save money. Things that are as obvious as the nose on your face. Pennsylvania purchased uh, about $3.8 billion worth of goods and services. But we never sourced our purchasing. So for example, <laughs> When I became governor, PennDOT, our transportation agency, had over 700 individual contracts for office supplies, 700. <laughs> the entire government had several thousand. We now have one. And we saved about $20 million a year on that and about $6 million because we're able to close down government warehouses. By just sourcing our purchasing, piggybacking on other states that had good contracts, we were able to save $360 million a year. And we took that money and put it into programs. And then secondly, when I became governor, we had a $2.4 billion deficit. I had five weeks to prepare a budget. I knew we had to raise taxes my first year of my first term. But I said, what the heck, you know, if I'm going to be here for four years, let's do something. We put another half a billion dollars in for early childhood. I raised the second highest tax increase in the history of the state of Pennsylvania. And three years later, we got, I got reelected by 61% of the vote. Because we did something. And the lesson for politicians is, people don't care if you spend money as long as there's a return on the investment. And that's true. The reason infrastructure spending is so favored by the public compared to most other spending is because people can see the results. It's tangible. They can see it. They can ride on it. You know, they, they can drive over it. They, they can do things. Uh, if people see the results of what you're doing, see educational improvement. I can't tell you how many parents came up to me and said during my time as governor, I put three daughters through this school district. It's a good school district, but my youngest daughter was the only one who went through full day kindergarten. And governor, she was reading, to, reading well a year earlier than my two other girls. And they're all the same in intelligence. And it led to so many things in her, in, in her development. And, and that's what it's all about. So, so we taxed and we cut. We did both. Was that what you learned from being mayor? Was that Absolutely. the same approach as mayor? Same thing. When I became mayor, we had the biggest deficit in the history of, this, uh, of the city of Philadelphia. And I think 
the biggest deficit in, as percentage of revenue of any city in the country at that point. Yeah, one of the students wrote here, $250 million. Is that $250 million. Not to bring back bad memories. No, that was <laughs> $250 million on a $2.2 billion budget. So it's about 12%. Yeah. We're whopping deficit. We got rid of it in 18 months. Got rid of it in 18 months. I mean, it's, and again, we got rid of it. We took a, we did well in collective bargaining with our unions because the unions had over the course of time gotten work rules and benefit structures that were totally out of whack with the private sector. We won those back. Uh, and we also say, again, common sense, saving money. When I took over as mayor of Philadelphia was office, the office market was at, at its low ebb. There was vacancies all over the place and landlords were frantic to get long-term leases. So we took every lease we had we had one or two municipal buildings, but a lot of private leasing space. And we went to them and said, we'll re-up for five years. That's the good news. The bad news is you have to give us a significantly lower rate right now, immediately. Even if we've got three years to go on the lease, we'll extend to eight years, but you've got to drop your rate right now. We saved $27 million just by doing that. $27 million. There was one lease, uh, I remember this story, uh, did, like it's yesterday. We were at a Class C office building, part of the Department of Public Welfare. Class C, it's A is the best, B, C. And I got a call from the Office of Management and Pro Productivity, the head of that, in my third week as mayor, and he said, look, this lease rolls over every February 1st with an 11% kicker. And I said, oh my God, we've been in that building for years. What are we paying? He said, we're paying $33 a square foot. For Class C. For Class C. At that time, you could get the best office <laughs> building in Philadelphia, One Liberty, was $19 a square foot. <laughs> I said, tell them we're moving out. He said, what do you mean? Where will we go? I said, I don't care if we go in the city hall courtyard and we put a tarpaulin up uh, over the desks. We're moving out. So he called me back the next day and he said, we don't have to move out. I said, what do you mean? He said, we got a new 10-year lease. I said, for what? He said, seven dollars a square foot. It's not rocket science. Yeah. It's not rocket science. I'm not sure that the federal government, I know Al Gore did some mm -hmm. of this when the Clinton Gore team took over, but I'm not sure the federal government, I am sure that the Defense Department hasn't done it, for sure. So there's money to be saved. Let's move a little bit maybe to, to national politics. You and I spoke uh, this morning, you were telling me how uh, and, I'll, and I'll preface this by saying I know you're a supporter of the president, but we were talking about how it, when you, if you had been elected president in 2008 mm -hmm. and the economy was in the tank like it was, yeah. how you might have handled this, the uh, stimulus proposal, the politics and the policy <laughs> differently. Right. And I just thought it was really interesting if you could share I wanna, that. I want to just qualify one thing Trey said. I don't think I said if I had been elected president because that's something that, uh, I, who would want to run for president? <laughs> Spend four years of your life in God for You get a nice places. house, you get to work where you live. Eventually, but, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I, what I did say is, it's, it's, uh, this is actually a, a correct story. President-elect Obama called me in mid-November, about a week or 10 days after the election, and said, I was chairman of the National Governors Association, said, I want you to bring every governor into uh, Philadelphia on December 1st. And I said, Sure, I can do that, the president-elect. We brought 54 governors. There are four territories that have governors as well as uh, the states. And we all came in. The president talked to us about the stimulus plan and got our advice on certain things. And I know president, Vice President Biden very well, much better than I knew Senator, Senator President-elect Obama. So I said, Joe, I've got some thoughts. And he said, sit down with Alan Hoffman and give it to him. And what I said is, Look, right now, the president-elect has 81% approval rating. People think you walk on water, you guys. Have the president design that stimulus bill, what he wants in it, and we advised him heavy on infrastructure. He didn't take our advice. The infrastructure spending was, I think, a total of like 67 or $77 billion out of 870. 
it should have been a third of the 870 in my judgment, but, but anyway, um, I said, do it, have every element of it job producing. If the Congress wants to load it up with social welfare stuff, the Democrats were frustrated because they could never get any social welfare spending in through President Bush. I said, I think they're gonna try to load up the stimulus bill, unfortunately I was right. I said, keep, make sure they keep it out of it. You design the bill, send it to Harry and Nancy, and the Democrats had big majorities at that time. Send it to Harry and Nancy and say, dear Harry, dear Nancy, here's our stimulus bill. Of course, you're free to look at it and suggest amendments or changes, but I want this bill to go in as close to intact as possible. And I want it enacted so that it's on my desk on Inauguration Day. And I'm gonna take the oath of office, go in and do the luncheon, then walk down Pennsylvania Avenue, and normally the president walks down to the White House and then takes his seat in the reviewing stand for the parade. I'm gonna go inside the White House into the Oval Office with a couple of pool cameras and sign the stimulus bill within two hours of being president. Do you think anybody would have said that President Obama didn't do anything for job creation, which is the party line now? Totally ignored job creation, it was concentrating on health care. If within two hours he signed his stimulus bill, then not that night, because you had the balls, but the following night I would have addressed the nation, gone through every major component of that bill and explained why there was stimulus. Increasing the stipend for food stamps, incredibly stimulative because you spend food stamps in the month you get them. They're good for October. You have to spend them. You can't save them. You get out and spend them. It helps mom and pop stores. It helps big grocery chains. It helps American farmers. It helps food processors. Unemployment comp, extension of unemployment comp, or raising the benefit level, same thing. Explain that. Explain that every billion dollars of infrastructure spending creates 25,000 jobs, not only on the construction site, but back at factories that produce steel and asphalt and concrete. Go through every element of it. The Republicans would have been dead in the water. Instead, we didn't do anything, and by the time the bill was passed, the Republicans spun it mightily and effectively in the first three days, and they isolated the social welfare spending, the spending for swimming pools, and by the time the dust cleared four days later, stimulus bill had a 67% disapproval rate. It never changed, even though the CBO has said, and the CBO is a fairly conservative organization, said that stimulus, Without st the stimulus bill, we would have had a 1% to 2% higher unemployment rate, which is a dramatic number, and yet the president got no credit for it. He also gave us a tax cut. All of us working families got an $800 tax cut. If you stopped 1,000 people in the streets of Boston who earned less than $250,000, that was the tax cut was for people who earned less than 250, and asked them, did you get a tax cut from the original Obama stimulus bill. How many do you think out of 1,000 would say yes? Anybody? I'd say 10. Couple. Yeah. I'd say 10. Yeah. Well, had I been the chief of staff, I'd have sent a check out. Tim Geithner would have sent a check out with a letter to every American family <laughs> saying, this is an $800 check from President Obama's stimulus plan. The president knows you might have to save some of it, but he hopes you spend it to help us generate, econo uh, generate economic growth. I think anybody would forget that they got an $800 <laughs> check from the president of the United States. It would have cost a little bit of money to do that, no question about it. Why didn't the Obama administration do that? Because the economists, including the former president of Harvard <laughs> University. His office is right up there. Right. The economists down there if you're there. convinced them, convinced <laughs> President Obama that if people got a check for $800, they'd be more likely to save it and they wouldn't spend it. Whereas if he gave it to them $19 pay period in payroll deduction, they would spend it. I'm not sure I agree with that, but I don't care. <laughs> I want to make sure my guy gets credit for something that was, I think, a, a tremendously gutsy move to do. So I think they did virtually everything wrong. And they did everything wrong in health care. Same thing, they let, the, they let Senator Baucus write the health care bill. Well, I like Max Baucus, but I didn't vote for him for president. 
toward a few months, and, and we're, uh, in a, we're in a heated presidential contest. Once again, Pennsylvania is a battleground state. Both sides think they need to win it in order to be elected president, whether it's uh, Governor Romney, Governor Perry, or Herman Cain versus the president. When you're campaigning around Pennsylvania, making the case for President Obama, what would you tell your former constituents about why they should reelect the president? Because I think he's done some terrific things that he hasn't gotten credit for. I mean, in the 2010 election, we all ran away. We Democrats ran away from the health care bill. Even people who voted for it ran away from it. It was the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Again, I don't know how many uh, of those Democrats y y you represented, Ted, but if you voted for it, do you think the other side wasn't going to point out that you voted for it? That if you didn't mention it, they wouldn't point out, shh, <laughs> I voted for the health care bill, but shh. The other side's going to point it out, right? So in 2010, five things took place because of the health care bill. Every one of them people loved. Every single one of them people loved. You guys could stay in your parents' health care up to the age of 26. Parents loved it. Young people loved it. If you were 25 years or under, you could no longer be denied health care for a pre-existing illness. Who didn't like that, and who didn't think that was fair? If you were a senior citizen, you got a $250 check from the federal government to cover the donut hole in Medicare Part D. If you were any of us, you no longer had a cap on the amount of money that your health insurance provider could spend on you. The caps were lifted off, the yearly cap and the lifetime cap, lifted off. And if you were a small business of 25 employees or less, you got a 35% tax credit for that year. Why didn't we talk about those things? Why did we run and hide? Especially if you voted for them. <laughs> talk about them. Get out there. I'm going to talk a, a, about the things that are good in the health care bill, and there's a whole lot more good than bad in the health care bill. People don't necessarily understand that, but they've got to hear it. I'm going to talk about stimulus. We know what stimulus did in Pennsylvania. You can point to roads and bridges all over the Commonwealth, and stimulus made a difference. I'm going to talk about all of the things. You guys, you don't have to go through a middleman for student loans anymore. That cut the cost of student loans dramatically. Maybe not for some of you. You may have been locked in. But for future students, that's a great achievement. Credit card reform, great achievement. The Office of Financial Responsibility, or whatever they're calling it now, if Elizabeth Vale is here, she works in it. It's a great achievement. It's not perfect, but it's a great achievement. Those are the things I talk about. And I also talk about the fact, and we're going to get into this, I think, later in the week, but the Occupy Wall Street, et cetera, groups, they have a very salient point. And their major driving point is that the gap between rich and poor, the gap between rich and middle class has grown has exploded in the last decade, decade and a half, and it's a frightening thing for this country. It is antithetical to everything that we believe in as a country, and something's got to be done about it, and something's got to be done about it. So those are the things I talk about. And I would also talk about you know, the, this whole debate. I assume the debate will be raging in 2012 about whether we should increase taxes on corporations, and when I say increase taxes, take away loopholes for corporations. 38% of American corporations pay no taxes. Do you think the American people know that? They all think GE doesn't pay any taxes because they know about that. But 38% of American corporations don't pay any taxes. Absolutely outrageous. Absolutely outrageous. We've got to change that. This idea that if you raise taxes on the job creators, we're going to kill the economy. Well, you can debate whether the Clinton administration's increase in taxes on the top 2% in 1993, you can debate whether that caused 23 and a half million new jobs to be created, but you sure as heck can't debate that it didn't kill the economy. I wish we could go back and hear the debate when the Clinton tax bill budget and the tax bill was being debated. Republicans said, this tax increase on the job creators will kill the economy. This will drive us to recession. 23 and a half million new jobs. It didn't kill the economy. 
And actually, if you look at the last 60 years, if you look at the last 60 years, the top five years of job growth, the highest marginal tax rate was 70%. The top 10 years of job growth, the highest marginal tax rate was above 50%. Of the top 20 years of job growth during the last 60 years, only one of those years was the marginal tax rate at where it is now, only one, only one. And the worst three years of job growth were when the marginal tax rate was where it is today. It is time to tell people the truth. And I think if we do that, it's not, a, it's not class warfare, it's fact. And it's fact that we have to change for a whole lot of reasons. So uh, that's the way I would campaign, and I think we've got a, a, a chance. And in fact, if the Congress refuses to do anything on the jobs bill, I think you spend most of your time running against the Congress. I said there were three ways I thought the president could win. Number one, if the economy turns around, not very likely. It, it doesn't have to turn around completely. It has to, the trend has, it has to trace an improvement, that's right. Number two, if the Republicans nominate someone it's a little on the wacky side. Uh, but a volunteer? Uh, almost like everyone. <laughs> <laughs> almost everyone. Everyone who doesn't, who's in. They like uh, their candidates a little on the wacky side. Every uh, one whose name doesn't begin with an R or an H. So <laughs> if they nominate someone like that, the president wins. And thirdly, if the Republican Congress continues to stonewall on jobs, on the payroll deduction tax, on unemployment, the compensation extension, if they continue to stonewall, then you run against the Congress, and I think you have a real chance to win. Because I thought the president, I've obviously been critical of the president's messaging, which is so ironic, because he was the best messenger in the history of politics. But I've been critical of his messaging, but I thought his message on the jobs bill was spectacular, because he did a pretty good job of explaining each substantive part of the jobs bill, but what he did best was letting the American people know that every element of the jobs bill had been supported by many Republicans in the current Congress. Every single facet of what he proposed had been supported. So now the American people are saying to themselves, well, guys, if you supported this stuff in the past, it's only one reason you're not voting for it now, so you want to bring the president down. And that's something to run against. So I don't think it's over by a long shot. It, it, if you look at the 20 battleground states, it doesn't look good for the president by any means right now, but we'll see. Well, let's bring everybody else in the conversation while you ponder that it's Buddy Romer who could be a good That's right. Yeah, he an R. R. Is um, he a declared candidate? He's a declared candidate. He just can't get on the stage. Uh, he's actually an IOP fellow from back in the 90s. Well, let's bring you all to the conversation. We've got microphones here in the front. Uh, please come forward. Uh, as is our tradition with the uh, John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum, we encourage you to ask questions. We want you to identify yourself. Tell us your affiliation if you have one. Um, ask a question that's brief, that does not contain a speech, and ends in a question mark. And we'll try to get as many in as we can. Uh, why don't we start over here? Hi. Uh, my name is Matt Shue. I'm a freshman at the college. Uh, you talked a little bit about um, education reform. I'm just wondering, uh, what role do you think the national government has in education, if, if at all? Um, and do you agree that the states are kind of laboratories for innovation in education and in any other area? Yeah, I think states are laboratories for innovation in virtually everything. And I think the federal government, the role I would do in, in education, and I think Secretary Duncan's done a terrific job, is spur that on by things like Race for the Top. Uh, reward innovation, reward progress, reward creativity. But I think the federal government should be more of a participant in the most important facet, which is early childhood. If anybody here has ever worked for constr in, a, in construction, you know if the building's foundation is built in a lousy way, the building's not gonna sustain itself for very long. So I think I'd look for a slight uptick in federal money uh, in pre-K and maybe guarantee full K and only give it to states that are willing to match, you know, and make it a little bit like highway funds make a requirement for state to match, and then reward creativity, reward progress, as Secretary Duncan has done. And No Child Left Behind, I think, 
is strange to hear a Democrat say. I think it's been a benefit to the country because it brought in accountability. And until we had accountability, we didn't know how badly we were doing. And until we knew how badly we were doing, we didn't have the impetus to change. But no child left behind it can't be one size that fits all. And the president and Secretary Duncan are right to give states a little bit more flexibility. And also, remember, No Child Left Behind's biggest failing is the funding that President Bush proposed when he announced it with Senator Kennedy. They never reached that. The Republicans in the Congress never, ever came close to what President Bush had proposed. Thanks, Matt. Next up here. Thank you. Good evening, Governor. Uh, Carl Sortino, I'm a state rep here in Massachusetts and also in the mid-career MPA program. Thank you for your years of service. Uh, I know you've been a big supporter over the years of casino gambling, and we have a debate going on here in Massachusetts now, and I'm curious if you had to do it over again, do you have any advice for what we could do to prevent some of the negative sides of casino gambling? And how'd you vote on that? Just out of curiosity, I know you guys... I voted no. Okay. Are these like box seats? These are box seats. He paid more for that. <laughs> <laughs> so you got courtside seats and basketball. Right. Do, yeah, do, they serve, box seats. do they serve food in those seats? I think it's, it's, it's cafeteria food, but it's food. Um, the, the answer is, look, I think you have to take a, a realistic, pragmatic view about gaming. Um, when I became governor, there was a study by Deloitte and Touch that showed one million of the 12.5 million Pennsylvanians left the state every year to gamble. They gambled predominantly in New Jersey, in Delaware, and West Virginia, and some in Nevada. They gambled away over $3 billion. Pennsylvania was getting zero benefits from their gambling. New Jersey was, Delaware was, West Virginia was, and Nevada was. Um, you're not gonna stop people from gambling. If we outlawed all forms of gambling, there'd be dice games in the back alleys. If you look at the caves at the banks of the Tigris and Euphrates, you will find, and this is a fact, you will find dice carved into the caves. Gambling. You, you, you know, you, 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 you have a better chance of stopping adultery than you do of stopping gambling. <laughs> it's a fact of life. So I decided that since property taxes in Pennsylvania were crushing older people, that I might as well get some benefit from gambling and also create a method for gambling, addict, addictive gambling in Pennsylvania to get treatment. Under every state statute, if New Jersey has a gambling treatment program, you have to be a Jersey resident. Doesn't matter that you're a Pennsylvanian that got addicted down in Jersey, you can't get treatment. So we went and first went to slot machines and a few years later went to table games. Um, we are now the number one state in the country in gaming revenue. We produced last year $1.3 billion in gaming revenue. It eliminated property taxes, school property taxes, for about 150,000 senior citizens and cut by more than 50% property, school property taxes for another 300,000 senior citizens. The rest of us got a modest cut um, for our property taxes a a as well. Um, it created directly about 17,000 jobs in Pennsylvania, indirectly about another 25,000. It brought back the horse racing industry, which was on the brink of going out of business in Pennsylvania, which helped a lot of people, including Pennsylvania farmers, mightily. Uh, the upsides have been enormous. The downsides have been, are there a few more gaming addicts in Pennsylvania? War? Yes, but we appropriate $2 million a year for our gambling treatment program. We've never spent more than 500,000, and the gambling treatment program is advertised everywhere. Every time, <laughs> you do a TV ad or a billboard in Pennsylvania, if you're a casino, you have to post the gambling addiction hotline number. People just don't use it. Have there been some cases where we've had a few horrible cases where people have left kids in cars while they run inside to gamble. Fortunately, no one has, uh, uh, has suffered any serious injury, but to, to me, that's an enforcement problem. So uh, I, I don't see any any upsides. If you could convince me that Pennsylvanians would stop gambling, and none of them would gamble if we didn't have gaming in Pennsylvania, I'd be against it. But you can't convince me of that. 
I was, uh, my second month as governor, I was invited to make a speech by the Gaming Association at a place called Mountaineer. It's in West, West Virginia. Virginia. Yeah, the right Racino. Near, yeah. The Racino, right near the Pennsylvania border. Yeah. I went over at 11 o'clock, it was like a 12 o'clock speech, I pulled in around 11.30, I pulled into the parking lot, first of all, it was packed, and second of all, I couldn't find a West Virginia license plate in the parking lot. It was all Pennsylvania. So you tell me. And I have told Governor Patrick I'm happy to come up and testify, if, okay. if needed. As a Kentucky, I can tell you the impact on the horse industry has been tremendously positive. Dramatic. Smarty yeah. Jones, I think, was uh, a Pennsylvania bred. Actually, Smarty Jones helped us pass the act. He, yeah. was, he was so successful. But now what's happened is not only has our horse industry not gone extinct, it's thriving, and there are horses, quality horses are now being put out to stud in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Governor. My name is Patrick Hart. I'm a second year MPP. Uh, you've advocated a lot for infrastructure spending. Uh, one of the issues that has come up, I know, is the question of high speed rail and how we should invest in that. And I was curious about your thoughts on that, particularly mm -hmm. in a time when it is regarded with great <coughs> hostility at the national level by the Republicans. Well, thanks. Uh, I am an infrastructure advocate myself. Governor Schwarzenegger and Mayor Bloomberg started an organization in 08 called Building America's Future. And I have 17 separate entities that I work for now. It's the only one I work for for free. So uh, <laughs> it's a true labor of love. Um, it, it's a absolutely uh, uh, essential that, uh, that we do this. Uh, uh, the nation's infrastructure is absolutely crumbling. The World Economic Forum ranked us in 2005 as having the best infrastructure overall in the world. They just ranked us a month ago, we're 15th in the world now. Our air transportation, our rail transportation infrastructure is 18th in the world. Our port transportation infrastructure is 22nd in the world. And our air transportation infrastructure is 32nd in the world. We're behind Malaysia, Panama, Chile, countries like that. We're, it's crumbling before us. It hurts our quality of life. It's a significant threat to our public safety. And it's killing our economy, not just because of the absence of jobs from building our infrastructure, but it's killing our economy because goods movement is so important right now. Ports, with the Panama Canal being opened, we've got to dredge all of our East Coast ports or else they're not going to be available to take those super tankers that are going through the renovated Panama Canal. They'll all go up to Canada. So infrastructure is hugely important for so many different reasons, but it's the single best job producer, not only on the construction site itself, but back at those factories. And the two sectors of our economy hit the hardest are construction and manufacturing. And it is the, a significant answer to both of those problems. So we gotta get on the stick. Thank you. If you're in the front. Uh, wow, perfect. Next question, I think. I'm Joan Byron. I'm a planner who's done some transportation work in New York, uh, now a mid-career student uh, at the Kennedy School. In this political environment, I mean, infrastructure used to be kind of the centrist thing that everybody could agree on for all the reasons you said. You know, you can look at it, you can ride on it, you can see. It was a good ribbons. Republican issue. Yeah. yeah. And now we even see Democrats walking away from it. New York State, our transit, and our um, DOT both are out of money two years into their five-year capital plan. Um, the heads of the Port Authority and the MTA have both flown the coop. Our governor has basically said, not my problem. I think he's a Democrat still. So in this environment nationally, what does it take to build the kind of political support that we're gonna need to make those investments? I'm gonna answer your question. I just realized I didn't answer your yeah, question, right? The rail piece part of it. Are you still here or did you leave because you were so dissatisfied yeah. with my answer? No, the real piece, President Obama made a big mistake on high-speed rail. We, we did high-speed rail like it was a patronage program. We gave 32 states high-speed rail money, including Pennsylvania. We did, actually, both Amtrak and the state, we each put in $37 million and we took our Harrisburg to Philadelphia line from two hours to an hour and a half and we increased ridership from about 898, 898,000 to about 1.3 million. But we didn't need high-speed rail money. 
he got like $32 million. It, it, you know, we'll, we'll take it, but we didn't need it. High-speed rail in America. Our configuration as a country is different than Europe. It's different than Asia. There's huge gaps of wide open spaces where high-speed rail makes no sense. There's only three places in America that high-speed rail makes sense, maybe four. California coastline, maybe up to Seattle if you want. Boston to Washington, Chicago, spoking out to Detroit and those other close-knit Midwestern cities. Maybe something in Florida, maybe something in Florida. That's all we should do. That's all we should do. And we should do it because it's ludicrous. The greatest country in the world, the richest country in the world, our train system is laughable. The Acela is the fastest train we have. It averages 70 miles an hour. The Chinese and the, um, and the French are experimenting with trains that go 350 miles an hour. It's nuts. It is nuts. Because high-speed rail could help that 32nd ranked air transportation system. We should not be running shuttles from Boston to New York and New York to Washington. New York to Washington right now is about two hours and 35 minutes. If we did high-speed rail, even at modest 160, it would be like an hour and 25 minutes. Philadelphia to New York is an hour five right now. It would be 34 minutes. 30, Philadelphia would become a, a living alternative for people who work in New York. It is a little bit now. 34 minutes. You can't get from the Upper West Side to, to Penn Station in 34 minutes. You can't get from here to Dedham, because I just tried that today. So the <laughs> answer is, to how are we going to fund it? Well, that goes back to the question that the, the yeah. lady asked. First of all, we should fund infrastructure. The CBO, again, not a Democrat or a Republican organization, the CBO did a study in 2008, and as Casey Stengel used to say, you can look it up. They said we could justify spending $185 billion a year more on our infrastructure because the, the taxes, the economic benefits, that it would create would be justified spending $185 million more in infrastructure. You know, even the CBO says that, and they never count offsets. Federal government's way of budgeting drives me absolutely crazy. If you're a business, you're going to spend X amount of dollars to produce a new product line. Well, the new product line, you have an estimate, is going to generate X amount of dollars in revenue. So when you look at your business balance sheet, it's cost versus revenue. When we budget, we only budget cost. If in fact, think about this for a second, Building America's Future is recommending $200 billion a year more on infrastructure. If in fact, infrastructure produces 25,000 jobs for every billion dollars in spending, how many jobs is that? This is, this is Harvard, this is isn't it? No, it's not Wharton. That's the thing uh, I used to. It's 12 and a half million jobs. 12 and a half million jobs, average salary is $60,000 a year. What's the bracket? 28%? Just figure out what the taxes are on that. There are X dollars in taxes, billions of dollars in taxes. But we, only, we charge $200 billion to the budget. We don't charge any of the offsets, any of the corporate tax gains, any of that stuff. We don't charge any of it. All of the ancillary benefits to the steel companies, et cetera. We don't charge any of that. It's, it's nuts. In fact, the American Bar Association, and as a lawyer, I'm not always proud of the American Bar Association, but the American Bar Association is working on changing the 74 Budget Act so we can begin to count offsets in the way we budget. And by the way, OMB doesn't do it, and CBO doesn't do it. So yeah, we should spend money. But we should spend money wisely. We shouldn't build high-speed rail in places that are few. In Kentucky. And, well, that's right, in yeah, Kentucky, because there's no density. Yeah. You need to build it where people will ride it. Sorry. And so that's the answer to your question as well. Spend money. And by the way, that $200 billion doesn't all come from the federal government. It's federal government, state government, local government, the private sector. There's a big market for private dollars. Private dollars in China and Europe are dying to get in and invest in an American infrastructure. We can find that $200 billion a year. But it's time that we did big things as a country again. 
and we can do them. And we shouldn't have governors or, or, or mayors or senators who say we can't afford it. You can make a case that right now, if America doesn't do anything with its infrastructure, it will be a second-rate economic power within a decade, within a decade. And by the way, building America's future, 10 years of $200 billion additional spending, 10 years. We've got time for the last two questioners. Governor, my name is Gil Slovin. I'm with the Wealth Manage Management Division of a major bank. And we're held in, as you know, very low regard to the point where I sit <laughs> with my back to a wall in a restaurant. My question <laughs> to you, if you could sit down with the Jamie Diamonds and the Vikram Pandit from Citi and the others, what kind of advice would you be giving them today to offset uh, the terrible battering? What can they do, what should they do to help the uh, average voter, average citizen uh, with uh, mortgages underwater, with loans that they can't get? How would you direct them? Well, it, it's interesting. I, 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 the weakest part of my resume is finance. And if you ask me how to cure the mortgage problem, I would tell you I don't have a clue. Don't have a clue. Um, but what I would tell them is, um, is, so understand that I can't propose an easy answer to the mortgage problem. But I would say get your most creative and best people in a room <coughs> and figure out <coughs> how, with the least risk to your shareholders, you can do something about people who are facing real severe mortgage problems. Figure it out. There's got to be a way you can do it. Start loaning money again, particularly to, to small businesses, and announce you're doing it. But by the way, a lot of this could be solved if they went on good PR. The Infrastructure Bank, which is a proposal of BF and the federal government, say that you'll all get the 20 biggest banks in America together and say, you'll start off by putting $100 billion into the Infrastructure Bank. $100 billion in the Infrastructure Bank. $100 billion of investment would probably leverage, probably leverage a trillion dollars. Do it. You're going to get a return on your investment. That's, you know, because the infrastructure bank will loan out to roads that are tolled or whatever. You'll get a return on your investment. It may not be the best return, but it'll be a solid, stable, guaranteed return. Start doing stuff that, and then let people know you're doing it. Let people know you're doing it. I'm not saying become a welfare agency, but start doing stuff like that. And there are people out there uh, who know the answer to these problems. There are people out there, if they want to do it, they'll do it. And I have to tell you, where I departed with the banks, I was for the bailout when President Bush and, and uh, the Secretary uh, awesome. Paulson uh, did it. I, I knew it was necessary, and it was necessary, and in many ways, what the President did, what Paulson did, and what President Obama did afterwards, save the country. How's the automobile wor bailout working? Governor Romney. Governor Romney said he would let them all go out of business. Automobile industry in America is flourishing. Rahm Emanuel said on Meet the Press that Ford is setting up an assembly plan in, in, in the city of Chicago, 1,200 new jobs. So how's that auto industry doing? But my problem, the, the, how many of you saw the HBO movie Too Big to Fail? I actually had a screening last night here on campus. Ah, I guess students don't have cable out of that. So they don't, they actually don't have cable now. You don't have cable? That's a great. So you the undergrads don't have cable in their dorms. So you can't get it on demand. Yeah. Some, find some way to see Too Big to Fail. It, 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 you may, did you see it, sir? Yeah. The, the, to me, the most poignant part of it is when Secretary Paulson, who comes off as a hero in the movie, Secretary Paulson uh, goes outside and his inner circle is there. And they ask him, uh, uh, can we require the banks to, to loan this money out? And he said, no. And they said, the staff said, why not? He said, because they won't take it. And then Paulson walks away and goes into the men's room. And the three staff members are there. And the woman who's in charge of um, uh, uh, press for the- Cynthia Nixon. It was that her name? Yeah. The woman. Sex and the City. Oh, well, no, I thought I met her name in real life. <laughs> no, but she turns around and says, let me get this straight. We just gave them $150 billion, and we can't, 
they screwed it up. They screwed the economy up. We just gave them $150 billion, and we can't put conditions on it. That, to me, unconscionable. Unconscionable for the Bush administration, unconscionable for the banks. The banks knew their responsibility at that time, and that was to get that money into the economy. And they basically sat on that money. They did repay most of it, which is OK. But the whole purpose of putting the money in the banks was to stabilize them, A, and B, so they would loan it out. Loan it out. Loan it out. Maybe it won't make the most whopping return. Maybe you'll lose a little bit of it. I don't notice any of those banks you know, uh, uh, these days having trouble. They're all doing pretty well. So that's, that's where I departed. And, and it was partially the bank's fault, but it was also partially the government's fault. We should have put conditions on that money. So, interesting. But I, I, I can't tell you I know the answer, but I do know there are people out there who know the answer. The bank should do it, and they should publicize doing it. Can you imagine the impact if the 20 biggest banks sat with, had a press conference with the president and said, if the Congress passes the infrastructure bank, we will put the first $100 billion of private investment in. Bingo. Bingo. So if you see Jamie, tell him I said that. Last question. Governor, my name is Holly Flynn. I'm a freshman in the college, hailing from Delaware County, Pennsylvania. Yeah. And uh, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on the legislation that's currently in the Pennsylvania legislature uh, that would split the Commonwealth's uh, electoral votes based on the gerrymandered congressional districts. Um, is this good for Pennsylvanians, and will it pass, in your opinion? Well, just for the rest of you who probably don't know what Holly's talking about, and Holly, do you want to run for Congress, by the way? We're, we're, we're looking for a candidate in Delaware County. Wait, I guess Holly's not old enough? No. Probably not. Maybe next cycle. 25 for that, sir. You're not 25 now. Um, there's a proposal that Republican leader of the Senate put in, which, and it can be done by statute, which would split Pennsylvania's electoral votes, and we'll have 20 the next time, We'll split them by congressional district, like two states in the country do, Nebraska and Maine. And so there are 18 congressional districts. You get one electoral vote for carrying a congressional district, and you get two for carrying the state. And Governor Corbett, who's a Republican, he said immediately he was for it, and his explanation was that Philadelphia has too much control in presidential elections. I like that. <laughs> thought you were supposed to be mayor and governor of the entire state. But the Republicans, <laughs> I, I said, would Governor Corbett and Senator Pelleggi have put this legislation in had the Republicans carried Pennsylvania the last five times? And of course, the answer is no. Um, this is a bad idea for Pennsylvania for so many reasons. It's a bad idea because we would go from being a state that's one of the three most important in a presidential election where literally hundreds of millions of dollars are spent by the campaigns to a state where we would essentially be New Mexico. Because the way it would break down, the best a winner would win Pennsylvania by was five electoral votes. Because there are some congressional districts that will always be Republican, some will always be Democrat. So we'd be New Mexico. No one would pay any attention to us. It would also hurt our clout because we're such an important state presidentially. Every senator who wants to be president. Which is all of them. Which is all of them, <laughs> right. <laughs> Always are, are, are more conducive when the governor of Pennsylvania calls doing something for Pennsylvania. So it would hurt us in that way as well. And plus the fact it's blatantly political. And lastly, no state should do this on their own. If we want to do this across the country, I'm fine with it. So. Let Texas split its votes by congressional district. All of a sudden, the Democrats pick up eight votes in Texas that they would never, ever get. So I said the delicious irony here would be if somehow, and it's unlikely to happen if they did this, that uh, uh, Governor Romney carries the state by a narrow margin. President Obama gets nine electoral votes out of the 20 or eight and becomes president by a margin of five electoral votes. It would serve them right. Probably not likely to happen. But the good news is this is not likely to happen because we have 13 incumbent Republican congressmen 
and 12 of them have written the legislature to say they're against it. Why would they be against it? Because right now, in presidential years, a lot of the money the DNC and all goes into Philadelphia to jack up turnout. If Philadelphia only had three electoral votes and couldn't influence the 20, Philadelphia, it doesn't matter how much money you spend, those three electoral votes are going Democrat. They take all that money and spend them in the other congressional districts. <laughs> the Republican incumbents, that's, a, for example, Delaware County. <clears throat> that's a swing district. It used to be Democrat. In the last election, it went Republican. Congressman Meehan, the last thing he wants is additional money being Democratic money going into Delaware County. And that would happen because there'd be no motivation to, to jack up the turnout in Philadelphia and in Pittsburgh because you couldn't change those outcomes. So it, it will fail. And it's a terrible idea. And let me say this, and I try not to be partisan. For those of you who watch me on TV, I think I'm as less partisan as almost any Democrat. Um, and it's nice I now get paid for doing what I did for free all those years on TV. <laughs> but um, I, I think it's reprehensible what Republicans are doing in terms of voting around the country. They are systematically trying to make it harder for people to vote for their own partisan advantage. And it's true. I mean, this, these voter ID things, forget immigrants. What about seniors? How many seniors in, in Delaware County don't drive and therefore don't have driver's license? And you're going to tell them they have to find some form of identification? Oh, sure, passports. There are a lot of seniors in Philadelphia who have passports because they go to Paris every other day, you know? <laughs> it's ridiculous. We should be, as a nation, making it easier for people to vote. Not harder. We should have early voting in Pennsylvania, not a, 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 a voter ID law like it's having. Republicans should, seriously, they, they, there's got to be, they ought to be ashamed of themselves. I mean, you, you, winning elections is a laudable goal, but keep the play, I mean, let's make Americans, let's make it easier for Americans to vote, not harder. So I, I, I just think it's reprehensible what they're doing. And again, I don't usually make broad statements like that. But I don't think, but one thing you can do, Holly, write your legislators and write Senator Pelleggi, because he's a Delaware County guy, tell him you think it's an idiotic idea. <laughs> no, you should. You should. I got one question um, for you to, to wrap up. What's up with the Eagles? <laughs> Are they going to turn it around? I think, no, I think they're, oh, Michael Vick. Michael Vick's been, even though he's turned the ball over, he's been extraordinary. Yeah, he's been good. Without the Michael Vick, the Eagles would have been blown out of all five games. But the Eagles uh, made a big mistake. They went for the big names in free agency, and they didn't take, they didn't address like the their Red, needs. We weren't talking about the Red Sox, sir. They didn't address their needs. <laughs> but you're right. So they had three of the best cornerbacks in pro football, but there are three of them, and only two can play at one time, except in the nickel. And they didn't address linebacker. They didn't address offensive line. They have, I think, the most talented quarterback in the game, and he runs for his life all of the time. You watch the Eagles play. It's like schoolyard yeah. football. It's Michael Vick fading back. The other team in hot pursuit. Occasionally, he just breaks through the pursuit and runs for 60 yards like he did one Sunday. He also passes on the run more accurately than anybody I've seen, but he's there's not a chance he'll make it through 16 games. Yeah, he's getting pounded. Yeah, getting pounded. Well, we've got a lot of activities the rest of the week, but please join me in thanking Governor Rendell for tonight. And Before I let you all go, we have two announcements. Uh, if you want to stick around, there's, as we alluded to tonight, there's a presidential debate. And at 8 o'clock, we're going to show the forum. Uh, in the forum, we're going to show the presidential debate. Uh, and some, several of the IOP fellows and others are going to stick around and we'll provide expert commentary. We'll probably have some fun while watching the debate. Uh, second thing is on Thursday, we've quickly organized a forum entitled We Are the 99% From Frustration to Occupation. It's about the Occupy 